If you have a Bible or somebody else around you does, you can look on with. Uh, before we get to Psalm 95, which we're going to camp out this, this morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to Exodus chapter 19. So go to the very beginning of the Bible. It's actually the second book in the Bible, Exodus chapter 19. And while you're turning there, I want to welcome especially those of you in Montgomery County, Loudoun, Prince William. It is good to be together in different places around God's Word. And I want to I start our time in God's Word today with a question for us. So here it is. Do we actually realize here and in other campuses the wonder and the weight of what we're doing right now? And so for this hour plus that we've gathered together in these different places, do we realize the wonder and the weight of what we're doing? Because I think it's possible to come in here on a, on a Sunday morning like this and just kind of go through the motions and not actually realize what's happening here. And that's why I want to start in Exodus chapter 19, because... I want us to see how what's happening during this hour plus goes back a long way. Way back near the beginning of the Bible. So God's people were slaves in Egypt. God delivered them out of slavery for a reason. You remember what the reason was? God told Moses to go to Pharaoh in Egypt and said, say, let my people go so that they might, anybody know? Worship me. God said, let my people go so that they might gather together and give me glory. And that's exactly what happened. God delivered his people out of slavery in Egypt. He guided them to a mountain, Mount Sinai, where they gathered for worship before God. And that's where we pick up. Look at Exodus chapter 19. Look at verse 16. So just imagine this scene. Try to picture it. Try to hear the sounds Verse 16 of Exodus chapter 19 says, On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast so that all the people in the camp trembled. Then Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God. And they took their stand at the foot of the mountain. Now Mount Sinai was wrapped in smoke because the Lord had descended on it in fire. The smoke of it went up like the smoke of a kiln and the whole mountain trembled greatly. And as the sound of the trumpet grew louder and louder, Moses spoke and God answered him in thunder. The Lord came down on Mount Sinai to the top of the mountain And the Lord called Moses to the top of the mountain, and Moses went up. Is that not an awesome scene? Have you ever seen a trembling mountain? The mountain is trembling. It's wrapped in smoke. Lightning, the Lord speaking in loud thunder as the people gather together to worship him and to hear him speak. Right after this, God gives his people the Ten Commandments and the rest of his law. And what's happening here, what we just read, would become a pattern throughout the rest of the Old Testament. Now, not always in this kind of scene at Mount Sinai, but all throughout the Old Testament, God's people would regularly gather together to worship him, to hear his word, In a sense, this is what it meant to be a part of the people of God, to have this privilege of standing in the great assembly before God. You may remember a few months ago, we were in Nehemiah chapter 8. We saw the people of God gathered together. They stood for hours worshiping, listening to God's word with their hands raised, crying out, amen, amen. People bowing down with their faces to the ground. God's people gathered together to behold his glory, to hear his word. 
So it's interesting, when you get to the pages of the New Testament, the word for church in the Greek, in the original language of the New Testament, the word for church, ekklesia, literally means assembly or gathering. So the church, what is the church? It's the assembly. It's the gathering of God's people. So you've got to see this. Turn with me now to the New Testament. Go over with me to Hebrews. So it's near the end of the New Testament, Hebrews chapter 12. You've got to see this. Turn over there because in the book of Hebrews, the author of Hebrews is encouraging Christians who had, who were not assembling together in the church. They were neglecting to assemble together. The author of Hebrews in chapter 10 says, don't give up meeting together. And in chapter 12, he tells them why, why this assembly is so important. And he contrast what they're doing with what happened in Exodus chapter 19. So look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 18. Follow along. The author of Hebrews says, for you, he's talking to New Testament Christians here, which by implication is us, those who have placed their faith in Christ, you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them. This is what we just read about in Exodus 19. For they could not endure the order that was given. If even a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned. Indeed, so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I tremble with fear. Now here's the contrast. He says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who were enrolled in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of the righteous made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkled blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. Do you realize what we just read? So the author of Hebrews just told us as the New Testament church, when you gather together, you're not coming to an earthly mountain like they came to in the Old Testament. No, you're coming to something greater than a trembling mountain with wrapped in smoke and thunder and lightning. You're coming to something greater. You're joining with a heavenly assembly filled with throngs of angels and heavenly hosts, and saints throughout the ages, and together you're gathering to give glory to God, to hear him speak, not through thunder, but through his word. So I, I see this in the Bible, and then I think, oh, we, I think we just have a tendency, if we're not careful, to miss this. We have a tendency to come into a gathering like this casually. Because this is what we, we do on Sundays. And it, it doesn't even cross our mind how awesome, how mind-boggling, breathtaking, how distinct what we're doing right now is than anything else we will do all week long. When we come together. We are joining in what God's people have done ever since Mount Sinai. We're gathering together right now here at other campuses to behold the glory of God. We're joining together here at other campuses with angels in heaven, saints throughout the ages to sing God's praise, to stand in awe of him and to listen to him, to listen to God speak. This is huge. Which is why, why John Stott said, true worship is the highest and noblest activity of which man, by the grace of God, is capable. But I just think we're, we're tempted to miss this. And I want to make sure we don't miss this. That we don't miss the wonder and the weight of what we're doing. That we don't miss the wonder and the weight of the one we're worshiping. A.W. Tozer said, in my opinion, the great single need of the moment, the great single need of the moment is that lighthearted, superficial religionists be struck down with a vision of God high and lifted up with his train filling the temple. The holy art of worship seems to have passed away like the Shekinah glory from the tabernacle. As a result, we are left 
to our own devices and forced to make up the lack of spontaneous worship by bringing in countless cheap and tawdry activities to hold the attention of the church people. Which is exactly what we've done all across the church in our culture, in our day. And I, I just want to propose today that it is not necessary for us to bring in countless cheap and tawdry activities to hold the attention of the church. I want to propose that the glory of God is more than sufficient to hold the attention of the church. So, so over the coming weeks, this is what we're going to do. We're just going to spend time together over the coming weeks in the Word, just gazing together on the glory of God. When I sat down with pastors here at McLean, including the pastors whose faces I put up on the screen last week, so diverse brothers from different campuses, we prayed, we asked God together where he wanted us to go in the word over the next few months, and he clearly showed us what Tozer said, particularly in light of transition in the church, that our greatest need is not to focus on this or that leader, this issue or that issue. Our greatest need is to focus, to fix our eyes and our hearts on God in all of his glory. That this, and this isn't just the greatest need in the church. This is the greatest need in our lives. Your greatest need, my greatest need in this room at other campuses is to know God. I mean, really know him. For real life is found in knowing God. And the last thing we want to do is go through the motions and miss the wonder and the weight of knowing and worshiping God. I just prayed, God, give us a great sense of expectancy when we come into a gathering like this. Where we're meeting with God. So here's the reality. I just want to put on the screen that I, along with our pastors, other pastors are convinced of, like we desperately, in our day, desperately need to rediscover the wonder and weight of worship before God. We desperately need to rediscover the wonder and the weight of worship before God. And I know of no better psalm that expresses that than Psalm 95. So let me invite you to turn me over there, just kind of open to the middle of your Bible. It should be around Psalms, Psalm chapter 95. So the plan is in the coming weeks, each week to look at a different psalm and to look at a different attribute of God including some attributes that we don't often talk about, which is why I think we have a low view of God many times. So I and different pastors are going to lead us in this way, but today I want to set the stage for this journey in a sense by reflecting on this reality that we need to rediscover the wonder and the weight of worship before God. And Psalm 95 is perfect for this because this psalm for centuries, going all the way back to the Old Testament and then in centuries of the church, has been used by God's people as a call to worship. And the first half of Psalm 95 depicts the wonder of worship, what we heard read just a minute ago from verses one through seven. And the last half of Psalm 95 depicts the weight or the seriousness of worship. And you put this together, Psalm 95 teaches us how we can rediscover the wonder and the weight of worship in two particular ways. So let me go ahead and mention them and then we'll dive into them one by one. So if we're going to rediscover the wonder and the weight of worship before God in our day, we need to do two things. Number one, we need to remember who we're worshiping. And then two, we need to realize how we worship him. So we need to remember who and then we need to realize how. So I'll start with the who. If we're going to rediscover the wonder and weight of worship before God, we need to remember who we're worshiping because we're tempted to forget. Let's just put this out on the table. We're tempted to forget. Not, not intentionally, I don't, I don't think. It just happens. Even in worship. You think about times of prayer and worship. Can we just be honest with each other. How easy is it for me or somebody else to stand up here on a stage and say, let's pray. So immediately we all close our eyes, bow our heads, but then before we know it, 
in a matter of seconds, our minds can just start to wander in all kinds of different directions. Am I the only one who does this? I don't think I'm the only one. Like this just, this just happens so easily. It's unintentionally. Like within seconds of somebody starting to pray, hundreds, even thousands of us can be thinking all, all of a sudden just all kinds of other things, details in our day, things we need to do, all kinds of random thoughts. In a matter of seconds, if we're not careful, in our worship, there could be this perfunctory prayer exercise taking place in this room and other campuses while I just wonder if all of heaven is shouting, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you realize the wonder and the weight of what you're doing? Like you're talking to God. And thousands of you at one time talking to God and he is listening to you. I'm sure he's upholding Mars at the same time in addition to trillions of stars that he knows by name and 7.2 billion people on the planet that he's sustaining their every organ right now. But you have God's attention in this place. Like, don't let your mind wander. See it? We can so easily lose sight of the wonder and the weight of what we're doing. And so Psalm 95 just lifts our eyes to the wonder of the one we worship. You just, you look at this text. What we heard read just a second ago. All the different descriptions of God in this psalm. You might write them down. Just think about who we're worshiping in this room. One, he's the self-existent Lord over all. So we've gathered together in this hour to worship the self-existent existent Lord over all. Verse 1, oh, come let us sing to the Lord. You'll notice in your Bible that Lord there is in all caps. And it's that way for a reason. Every time you see the word Lord, the name Lord in all caps in the Bible, that's the Hebrew name for God, Yahweh. It's how God revealed himself to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3. It means the I am, which is a reference to how God exists. Has always existed, exists now, will always exist exists the classic children's question when my four-year-old comes to me and says, who made God? There's one answer. No one made God. Buddy, nobody made God. He's always been and he will always be. God is unlike us. Unlike anyone or anything else in the world, everyone and everything in the world, including the world itself, came into being, but not Yahweh not the Lord. We've gathered together before this self-existent Lord over all. And the supreme king above all. He's the supreme king above all. Verse 3, the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. So he's the capital K king who reigns over all the little lowercase k kings in the world. He rules them. He's the supreme king above all. We've gathered together right now to worship the creator of the universe. Verses four and five. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it. And his hands formed the dry land. Oh, I love that imagery. The world is hand shaped and hand held by God. The God we are worshiping right now in this room and other campuses is holding the world in his hands. His hands formed everything around us. And not only is he the creator of the universe, he is the owner of the universe. It all belongs to him. Psalm 95, the mountains belong to him, the seas belong to him, he owns it all. You don't own land. I don't own land. God alone owns land. You think, we think we own possessions and property when ultimately God alone owns possessions and property. We've gathered together to worship the owner of the universe. And then it gets more personal down in verse 6. So he says, oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, Yahweh, the Lord, our maker, exclamation point. So the psalmist is just in awe, not just by how God has made everything in the universe, but how God has made him. 
He's the maker who forms and sustains us. You think about it right now. Like we are a symbol right now before the God who formed our hands and our feet and our legs and our arms. We're worshiping the God who is causing our lungs to breathe right now. Like the only reason your heart is beating at this moment is because the God we're worshiping in this gathering is causing it to beat. And were he to stop, so would you. He's our maker. The one who forms us, who sustains us. And he's the shepherd who loves and leads us. So it just keeps going. Verse 7, he is our God and we're the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hands. So, oh, get this, this God, this self-existent Lord over all, supreme king above all, creator, owner of the universe. He is our shepherd. We're his sheep. This God, this God is protecting us and providing for us. He cares for us. Which all leads to the question, how is that possible? How is that possible? I mean, think about it. We are sinners who've rebelled against this God. We've run away from him in all of his holiness. How can we be sheep in his pasture? And that question leads us back to the beginning of this psalm. Verse 1, where the psalmist says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. God is the rock who saves and delivers us. Which, remember, is the picture from Exodus, right? God saved his people from slavery so that they could worship him in freedom. And that is exactly what has happened. All across this room at other campuses, so sure, we weren't slaves in Egypt But this gathering today is full of men and women who were slaves to sin, separated from God, destined to pay the penalty for our sin, eternal death. But God, in his mercy, made a way for us to be saved from our sin. And oh, this is the real beauty of Psalm 95. And if you're not a Christian with us today, I invite you to listen particularly close here because this God, the same God of Psalm 95, this God is not distant from us. This God has come to us in the person of Jesus. You get to the New Testament, the book of John, we're introduced to Jesus as God in the flesh. And John 8.58 says, Jesus is the I am. Jesus is the self-existent Lord over all. Then John later writes in Revelation 19 that Jesus is the supreme king above all. On his robe is written king of kings and Lord of lords. Colossians 1.16 says Jesus is the creator. Jesus is the owner of the universe. All things were created through him and for him. And Jesus is the maker, Colossians 1.17 says, who forms and sustains us. In Jesus, all things hold together. Jesus, John 10, says, is the good shepherd who has laid down his life for us as his sheep. Indeed, Jesus is the rock of our salvation. Jesus has died on the cross for our sin. He's risen from the grave in victory over sin so that you and I can have the privilege of knowing and worshiping God as sheep in his pasture. Ah, do you see this? Do you see The weight and wonder of worship. Do you hear what Psalm 95, along with all the Bible, is shouting? Remember who you're worshiping. Don't forget. You come in here, it's not just a routine deal on a Sunday morning. Like you're gathering before God, the self existent Lord over all, supreme King above all all, the creator, owner of the universe, the maker who's sustaining your heart, the shepherd who loves and leads your life, the only rock who can save you from your sins. So come, let us sing. Ah, this is the transition. So this psalm reminds us who we're worshiping, and this psalm calls us to realize how we worship. So how do we respond to this God? Well, you just look at the list in this psalm. You might write these down. We, we sing to him. Number one, verse one, come let us sing to the Lord. And, and notice here, real, real quick side note, the emphasis here on us, let us sing to the Lord. So six times in the first six verses, this psalm says, let us. You might, you might circle it in your Bibles. Verses one and two, four times. Let us sing. Let us make a joyful noise. Verse two, let us come into his presence. Let us make a joyful noise. And you get down to verse six. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 
And I just emphasize that because worship uh, is clearly, according to the Bible, is clearly not a spectator sport, but a participant's activity. And particularly in a setting like this where I or those leading in musical worship are up on a stage, you're in a seat here at other places, almost theater style, it's easy for you to begin to think that you're a spectator. It's even for I and others up here to think that we're performing in some way, but that misses the whole point of worship. There are no spectators in worship. The closest thing to a spectator might be non-Christians who are here because there's a sense in which you're observing Christians in worship, but for every follower of Christ in this gathering, you're a participant in this thing. I am definitively not a performer for you. You are not an audience. No, God is the audience here. We're all participants on this stage. We come together. We sing. So, which in and of itself is somewhat unique to, to an outsider who's not familiar with church or with a worship gathering. This scene today might look somewhat funny. I mean, what is this? A bunch of adults gathering together for a sing-along? And the answer is yes. And there's a reason we sing, because we can't help but to sing praises to this God. We sing to him. We, how else do we worship? We shout to him. Now, unfortunately, this particular translation, the ESV in the second half of verse one says, let us make a joyful noise to the Lord. When most translations say, let us shout joyfully to the Lord, which is more the thrust of the Hebrew, the original language here in Psalm 95. So one Hebrew scholar studying this text said the phrase, let us sing, is way too tame for this text. Because this, this psalm is talking about making a lot of noise in worship, which we see in different psalms. I was reading Psalm 66 the other day. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Psalm 47 says, shout to God with loud songs of joy. This picture of shout in the Old Testament like a triumphant war cry that strengthens an army and brings fear to the enemy. And shouting like this needs to be a part of our worship. When we gather together for worship, it is all together right to shout to God. So biblically, this is right, to which people inevitably say, yeah, but don't people get carried away with that in many churches? And without question, there are abuses of this and many other biblical actions in worship. Which causes us to ask, well then, what, what does shouting in the Psalms look like practically in the church today? And I just think, just start to think practically about, I think about times when we're singing, the band gets going, our voices are raised in worship. I'm standing over here singing this morning, I know different campuses were singing different songs, uh, but we were singing Savior King, talking about Jesus our King, and there comes a point in that song where I just found myself transitioning from singing to yelling to the detriment of those around me. But, but just, I mean, there's a shouting that's, that's right and good to loudly give God praise. Which, which reminds us, so, so sometimes even during a song, maybe in between verses of a song, it's altogether right to shout out praise to God. In the middle of a song, just to shout, yes, God, like, yes, you are all these things. We're singing, holy, 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 just to shout out, yes, God, you are holy. There's no one like you. Uh, that's right, and that's what Scripture's calling us to do, to shout. We, we stand in awe of you. And not just to shout as we sing in worship, but even in the preaching of the word, as God's glory is being revealed in the word, I want to encourage you to shout. Like an amen here or there is a healthy thing. And I'm, I'm not just looking for that like response like, <laughs> I, I, <laughs> just follow me here. If, if I happen, if I happen to say something that you think is true or your heart resonates with, then shout out an amen or praise the Lord or that's right. And when somebody does that, don't everybody look at that person and think, dude, calm down. Or, or, or don't think, oh, hey, be careful, bro. Like if you encourage that guy up there too much, he will never stop. Like, don't worry about that. This isn't about me. It's not about you. It's not about drawing attention to anybody else but God. It's shouting to God in worship. There we go. 
so in worship, we sing to God, we shout to God. Keep going here. We bow down before him. We kneel before him. Do you know that the Hebrew word for worship actually it literally means to prostrate oneself before God? It's a picture we see all over scripture. That sadly in this room and, and other campuses, I think we're tempted to miss, even with just the way the seats are set up. But I, I want to encourage us biblically, if at any point in singing or praying or hearing the word, you are compelled to bow down, to kneel before God, then do so. Come to the front, on the side. I have read stories of spiritual awakening in the past. It was common for people, just a sensitivity to the spirit in the middle of singing or in the middle of the sermon, just to come down to the front, kneel before God and worship on the sides, all, seats all around the room. I would even say that if we are actually worshiping, surely we'll be compelled to do this at some point. If we really realize who we're worshiping in this room, then there will inevitably be times when individual ones of us, under conviction or just in awe, maybe many of us at the same time will fall on our faces before God in reverence and in awe. That is a right response in worship, to bow, kneel before God. I, I hope this is something you do alone with God. I hope that in your time with him, you're often on your face before him, like physically. And then as we do that alone, then I mean, none of us be so prideful that we wouldn't do the same in the assembly before him. What else do we do in worship according to Psalm 95? We thank God for all he does. We Praise him for who he is. Verse two, let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. So there's praise and thanksgiving in the psalm, both involved in worship. We exalt God for his attributes. We thank God for his actions throughout history, around the world, in our lives. Now, the video of the scripture reading at the beginning of the sermon stopped at verse seven which is where many people stop with the psalm. But we actually miss the whole point if we stop there. Because the psalmist starts talking about how worship doesn't just involve us singing and shouting and speaking to God, but worship involves God speaking to us. Like thunder from heaven. Which makes what we're doing in this room and other campuses right now even more mind-blowing. So what do we do when we worship? We listen to God humbly. Today, verse seven says, today, if you hear his voice. So worship involves hearing the voice of God, which is why what we're doing right now, like studying God's word is such a large portion of our worship gathering. We worship God by opening up his word and listening to him. Which is why I just, I want to encourage you to bring your Bible with you to worship. And if you don't have one, we will help you get one. We would love to help you get one. Just go out in the lobby, here, other campuses after the service, we will help you get a Bible. Because this, this book is the Word of God. Amen, and this is how God just think about the self-existent Lord over all, the supreme king above all, the creator, owner of the universe. He speaks to us. I think we're fooling ourselves if we think we're worshiping, but we're not like diving into his word and bringing his word, expecting to hear from him. So we listen to him humbly when we worship. And we obey him immediately. So this is the warning Psalm 95 is addressing. And it is weighty. Listen to verse 8. Follow along in your Bible. Psalm 95, at the end of verse 7, says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years I loathed that generation and said they are a people 
who go astray in their heart and they have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And that is how this psalm, this call to worship psalm ends with a warning of God's wrath on those who claim to worship God while they ignore the word of God. It's what happened at Meribah and Massah back in Exodus in the book of Numbers when God's people complained and quarreled before him. Ultimately, they disobeyed him by not trusting him, by not following him into the promised land. And an entire generation of God's people were left to wander in the wilderness until they died. And their sin is summed up in that phrase, they hardened their hearts. If we had time, we'd go to Hebrews 3, 4, and 5 in the New Testament, where the Bible urges Christians centuries later, based on Psalm 95, don't harden your hearts toward God and his word. Have a soft heart that hears God's word humbly and obeys it immediately. Immediately, This is huge when it comes to our worship. Think about it. We can come into a gathering like this. We can sing and shout. We can even bow down and kneel. But if, when we comes to God, when it comes to God's word, if either we don't hear it or we harden our hearts to it and go on living however we want, we will totally miss the point of worship. This is why I mentioned not just the wonder of worship, but the weight of worship. Because what we're doing right now is serious. Extremely serious. We're opening up the word of God to hear what God says, knowing that, ladies and gentlemen, we will be accountable before God for how we respond to what he has said. This week and every single week, and we will be found to be mocking God if we sing some songs, bow our head for some prayers, and then walk out of this place ignoring God's word. And that, Psalm 95 says, is a recipe for wrath. This is what Jesus himself warned against in Matthew chapter 15. He said, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me they worship me in vain. Oh, may it not be said of us that we worshiped God in vain in this room and other campuses. It's just so serious. Dale and I were talking about this in between services. The reality that what Jesus is talking about there in Matthew 15 is a sin that's unique to what is happening in this room where we can supposedly gather for worship on the outside while our hearts are hard toward God on the inside. I think of the number of people, particularly in our culture, who grow up in the church and then even continue in the church week after week after week, who go through the motions but sit there with hearts far from God. I think about kids who attend worship sometimes for years just to, Attending worship to appease their parents, hard hearts. I think about husbands who attend worship to appease their wives or vice versa. And I just want to urge you, based on the word of God, to not do this. I want to urge you not to be cold toward God in worship. Some of you are there. I'm guessing some of you have been there for years, maybe even all your life. And I just want to urge you, let, let today be the last day you worship God in vain. I want to urge every one of us, let's not hear this word this week or any week and then ignore it the next week. That is a dangerous, that is an eternally dangerous habit to get into. In worship, we listen to God humbly and we obey God immediately. And then follow this. When we do that, follow this, then we rest in him completely. Oh, that's the picture here. In the Old Old Testament, God's rest was the promised land, this abundant land flowing with milk and honey that he promised to bring them to. But they missed it. An entire generation missed it because they disobeyed God's word. 
They played around in worship. They missed it. When you turn the pages into the New Testament, Hebrews 3, 4, and 5 in particular, this rest in the Old Testament becomes symbolic for the rest that's found in following Christ in the New Testament. Abundant life in Christ now. Abundant life in Christ for all of eternity. So hearing and obeying the word of God is the path to life to abundant rest in God, to being forgiven of all your sins before God, to being enabled to experience all that God, think about it, the self-existent Lord over all, supreme king above all, creator, owner of the universe, knows what is best for your life. And he's given us his word to say, I want you to experience it. He's our maker, our shepherd, our rock, our savior, who's designed this for us. So, oh, here's the beauty. When we really worship, when we, when we realize what's going on, when we truly worship, what it does is it brings glory to God and it's really good for us. In the middle of a world of turmoil and pain and sin and suffering and death, worship is the way to rest in God, to life in God. This is what we do in worship. We come before God, we sing, we shout, we bow, we kneel, we give thanks, we offer praise, we listen Him speak to us, we obey what He says, and as we do, we rest in Him. And then, last thing the psalm says, says it in almost every verse, the whole tone of Psalm 95, that's why I left it for the last one. When we worship God truly, we rejoice in him wholeheartedly. Now it all comes together. Don't miss the logic of heaven in this text. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let's make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Why? Because the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He is our God. We are his people. Did you follow that? Rejoice in God. Why? Because he is supreme. And when you exalt his supremacy, you will experience his satisfaction. Ha, oh, joy. So, ladies and gentlemen, do you want to experience satisfaction in your life? I'm talking about a satisfaction that's, that no possession, no size house or, or car or this or that position might bring you. I'm talking about a joy that's deeper, higher, greater than anything your money can buy you. I'm talking about a joy that supersedes your circumstance. I'm talking about a joy that nothing in this life can take away from you. I'm talking about a joy that endures through sorrow and suffering. You don't want, do you want that kind of joy in your life? Then worship God. I mean, really worship God. You don't get that kind of joy playing games on a Sunday. You get that kind of joy by meeting with God, worshiping God, singing, shouting his praise, bowing, kneeling before him in awe and wonder, hearing his word to you, obeying his word to you, and letting that lead you to rest and rejoice in him forever. Oh, God, help us to rediscover the wonder and the weight of worship in our day. So, uh, I think it would be appropriate for us to sing and shout in response to this word. So here's what I want to invite us to do. Uh, in just a minute, I'm going to invite us here at the campuses to stand and sing and shout. Uh, the Lord so leads to kneel and to bow. But to realize what we're doing, and just to pause and realize, okay, who we're about to sing to. And we're about to sing to the self-existent Lord over all, the supreme king above all, the one who is the creator and owner of the universe. The one who makes us, the one who's causing our hearts to beat right now, the one who's giving breath to us to sing. And he's our shepherd. He loves us. He loves us. And he is the rock of our salvation. He's the one who saves us and delivers us. And oh, if you're not a Christian uh, this morning, I want to invite you uh, to go from uh, spectator to participant. I invite you to worship this God with us. Let, let today, today, today be the day where you trust in Jesus to save you from your sins, where you experience life in God, where you say, I want to worship you. You're Lord of my life. Oh, we invite you to say that with us. So, 
Sound good? Stand, sing, shout, worship. Let's stand together here, other campuses, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna pray for us. Oh, and as I pray, like, don't let your mind wander. Don't let your mind wander. Like, just, let's think about what we're about to do. Let's think about what we're about to do. Oh God, we pray that as we sing and worship for the next few minutes, God, that you would be honored with our lips and with our hearts. Lord, we pray for a rediscovery of the weight and the wonder of what we're doing right now. We pray that you would be glorified right now in our worship.